You can see aggregations of up to 80 polar bears a day visiting the bone pile at Kaktobe. You really are what you eat, and this is one of the classic examples of that. The back of their foreleg has some of the longest hairs on the bear's body. If you can imagine when they're walking through the snow, their forelegs being so furry kind of acts like a big boot with a big fur ruff. It protects their body from the snow and the cold. Some of the hairs grow up to 15 centimeters long. Pretty big hairs. The hair is a great tissue for examining diet because it grows over the course of a pretty long time. For bears, it's about five to six months. Hair actually provides a record of diet, whether that's for a bear, for wolf, for even for humans. When the hair's grown, it locks in the isotope signature of whatever they're eating at the time. And then that is preserved in the hair for as long as that hair is on their body. The different tissue sources actually allow us to create a isotopic clock or a timeline. So within a year, how do the diets of these bears vary, and does that correspond with bears that might be actually spending time closer to shore or bears that are spending almost all their time out on the open sea ice. A lot of other tissues are more dynamic. The blood is constantly changing, it's constantly turning over. Even muscle and other tissues, liver, are turning over and changing, but the hair preserves the record of their diet. Prior work had actually taken those hair samples and amalgamated those into kind of an individual number or an individual unit. But one of the things that we were able to do is to dissect that hair up into increments. And those increments then gave us a measure of diet variability over time. And what we initially had expected from the previous literature was there wasn't much variability in the polar bear diet, that it was all essentially using seals all the time. There are three whaling communities along Alaska's North Slope. The villages of Barrow, Nuiqsut, and Kaktovik. And they're about evenly spaced across the North Slope. Whaling, fall whaling occurs in September. That's the period when sea ice is at its minimum extent. That's the period when we have a lot of bears on shore. And so those bone piles become focal attractors for the polar bears. Nobody really sees these bears eat that much because they're out on the sea ice. They're in a pretty desolate place. To be able to observe them would be an extremely difficult task. You'd have to send people out there, try to follow around bears out on the sea ice in the middle of nowhere, really. So nobody really sees these bears eat. And that's one of the advantages of what we do is it has the power to observe populations or at least get an understanding of their diet where it would otherwise be nearly impossible. But what we were able to discover is that there are a group of bears that spend time closer to the shore and then on a very regular basis are using these whale bone piles as a secondary diet resource. We know that when you eat something, the stable isotope signature of your diet is going to show up in your tissues. Even though we never directly observe the bears eating, we have a really, really good idea, at least in a general sense, of what they're eating because of the stable isotope signatures of their prey. The different things that the polar bears eat have different amounts of this heavy isotope of nitrogen in them. So seals, way up the food chain, have a lot of heavy isotopes of nitrogen. The bowhead whales that are on the shore, for example, are a lot lower down the food chain and they have a lot less of the heavy nitrogen. If the bear is eating a lot of seal, we see the heavy nitrogen that gets incorporated into the hair and into the blood. And if the bear is eating a lot of bowhead whale, we see that there's a lot less of the heavy nitrogen that gets incorporated into those tissues. You know, bears in general are very quick learners. They're very smart animals. And if there's a little stretch of time where they're having a hard time hunting seals and they're in the vicinity of a bone pile, I think they might just take a little detour and come and check it out to see if there's some food there that they can take advantage of. And I think the biggest surprise then came when we asked ourselves, okay, they are spending a lot of time here, but what are they doing for the rest of the year? Are they just coming in to eat at the whale carcasses and then going back out onto the ice? Which is 
where bears typically spend most of their time hunting for seals? Or are they doing something different? Are their behaviors starting to change a little bit? We found that the bears who had spent time near the whale carcasses and who had a definitive bowhead whale signature in their hair had spent all of their year near the coast. A lot of these bears were spending 90% of their time within 50 kilometers of the coast. And the bears that didn't have the bowhead whale signature in their hair were not doing this. They'd only spent about 40% of their time near the coast and they had been ranging far and wide, hundreds of kilometers out on the sea ice. So they had changed their foraging strategy pretty significantly. Once you start feeding at the bone pile, you tend to kind of stay in close proximity to the bone pile, because why would you leave? It's, you know, energy rich food. You don't have to expend any energy to get it. It's really kind of a smart foraging strategy to just hunker down there and feed at the bone pile. And we see that on average bears spend probably about nine days or so feeding at the bone pile during a feeding bout. But we've seen evidence of bears using the Kaktovik bone pile even into January at a time when there's plenty of sea ice. A lot of people have said that, you know, there's few things that will let 20 or 30 polar bears get together without a fight, but a bowhead whale carcass is one of them. It's pretty amazing when you see these pictures of sometimes up to 50 or 60 bears hanging around one of these carcasses and everybody's pretty happy. A lot of the bears are doing the typical polar bear thing. They're going out onto the sea ice and hunting seals for pretty much the whole year. Most of the bears that we found were probably about 75% roughly were eating ringed seal or bearded seal for 90% of their diet for the whole year around. And then in about a quarter of the bears that we analyzed, we picked up at least some signature of what's most likely bowhead whale. That is on the high end of estimates of bears who come to shore and feed on the bowhead whale. And that definitely seems to be a change from 20 or 30 years ago. Um, we only looked at a really small slice of two or three years and we weren't able to get data for any bears for multiple years. So expanding this, looking at bears over the course of three, four, five years, and then looking at the broader population through time, we'll see if it's a persistent trend. But with the way the trends in the sea ice are going, it seems like it's a pretty likely scenario for these animals. This application of understanding the modern processes, where we have lots of information, GPS collars, fine scale analysis of hair, and then, and then bones that represent the lifetime of these individuals, we can then go back to previously recovered samples that might be 50 to 100 years old that were harvested by the Inuit community in historical times, and examine the question of whether or not the bear's behaviors have changed over the longer term. There's a lot of things that can happen once the bears start coming to the shore and hanging out near places where there's a lot of people because all of these whale carcasses are near communities on the North Slope. Inevitably, there's places where they can get human food, there's landfills, there's trash cans that are left unprotected. So the more you have these bears coming close to the human communities, the more chances there are for human-bear interactions and inevitably that, that's not always gonna be good.